Okay. Hi, Ron. How are you? Hi, Douglas. I'm great. How are you today? Doing great. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me. So you've got a new book out. It looks like it was released in January. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. The book is called Live Your Humanity. It's an interesting title. And <laughs> before we dive into the book, it looks like you were, uh, what was CFO? I uh, wasn't a CFO, but I was in senior finan financial management within um, an organization within the information technology industry. And I had spent about 20 years working in various roles within finance and leadership roles within finance. And uh, in my last role, I supported uh, total revenue of about $443 million a year with 37 direct employees. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was, okay. yeah, it was quite the job. <laughs> so you were a senior accountant. Would that be an accurate title? How about we say senior finance manager? Okay. That was my title. Yeah. Accountant doesn't sound as glamorous, does it? And, you know, it's funny, Douglas. There, there is, while their accounting and finance are the same, there are also a lot of differences between them as well. Um, my role was mostly in financial planning and analysis, where I would support the business by developing outlooks, you know, our forecast models every month and, and helping the business determine what their finances were going to be looking like on a monthly and a yearly basis. And so my role was to help plan uh, for, the, for the business leaders to understand where they, what their exact financial position was in the company. Well, that's interesting. So you were doing forecasting? I was. I was doing forecasting, monthly closing. My team was responsible for invoicing the customer. And then, of course, we were also doing some accounting in there with writing journal entries and posting those to the general ledger each month and so forth. And, and so it was, it was quite the wild ride uh, with that much revenue that you were responsible for on a monthly basis. Well, I'm just wondering, like I have a small company, DJC Music and Productions. That's what we produces this show. Uh, okay. And I don't know how in the world I would ever forecast what we're going to spend next year other than <laughs> the normal monthly things like paying for the Internet and paying for the electric in the studio. And, you know, how does yes. how does one determine that? Because things change. Well, things do change. But, you know, as you probably know, that we, we a lot of organizations focus on growth from one year to the next. So. You know, let's say this year you may be bringing in 400 million in revenue. Next year they might want you to bring in 500 million in revenue, and so you have to forecast in your numbers how you're going to do that. And uh, that's where the trick comes in because then you have to get your sales teams involved to work with you to go after new business, and you have to be able to forecast what that new business is going to bring in. Okay, so round, <clears throat> rounding up new customers or raising your yeah. prices. Yes. <laughs> uh, or eliminating overhead, right? That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes sense. And it is kind of a, uh, you know, it is kind of looking, looking into the crystal ball and trying to figure out exactly what you think might happen. Sometimes you hit the mark, sometimes you don't, but at least you have an explanation to explain that variance. Well, so that's, you can move yeah, forward with that. That's true. And then the, the unknown is always the uh, economic situation of the country generally. If we go into a recession or rampant inflation like we're seeing now, uh, then all those things have to be factored in as well, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So is this your first book or have you written another this book? This is. Okay. Yeah, this is my first book. Why did you decide to write this book? Well, you know, I, I write in the book about how uh, I had a, a common traffic accident that, or not accident, incident, I should say, uh, that made me rethink how humans are interacting with one another today. But before I did that, I really took a good hard look at myself. And, you know, when we were talking earlier about you know, my job as in finance, it was an incredibly stressful role. And I had lots of long days at work, you know, sometimes 12 hour days, you know, and you come home and you're exhausted at night and, you know, you're kind of, kind of cranky, uh, you know, maybe a little withdrawn. 
and not really presenting your best self to the world. And when I went through this little incident, which no one was hurt, okay, we'll get that out on the table here. No one was hurt in the incident, but I started thinking about the state of human connection that we have with one another today. And when I say that I was looking at myself, I was also pretty withdrawn and not really all that interested in connecting with other people. And I knew that that was a situation that just couldn't last, right? And so I set out to change it. And the irony here is, is that you walk down the street today and you see people staring at their phones. You know, we're all looking at our devices all the time. And we have the whole world in the palm of our hands and we could connect to anyone at any time. Yet today, people are reporting that they're the loneliest that they've ever been. And I think that what has happened is, is we've gotten so busy in our lives that we've forgotten to nurture all of those human values that I say we come off the factory floor with, which are values like kindness and generosity and humility and love to include self-love. And when we let those values go dormant, uh, it really has a negative impact on how we connect with one another if we do it all. You know, that's a very good point. And it's sort of the irony of the internet. When I first got the internet, I was in my early 30s when it really started to come around in the 90s. And I thought, oh, this is great. This is going to be the biggest technological leap since electricity and <laughs> gas powered cars and airplanes. And, and it really was in terms of how it affected society. And I thought the world is going to connect. We're all going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. This is going to finally bring <laughs> world peace. I was a little naive in those days. What has happened is almost the opposite effect. On the one hand, like you said, we are all connected. We can talk to anyone at any time. And yet people are more disconnected than they've ever been. And, and the reason that I think that has happened is because the internet provides a veil for people. That's right. It's not the same thing as meeting somebody face to face. The phone. That's right. I mean, a literal veil to a metaphoric one is that you can uh, like put pictures of yourself up and you can gloss them over with Photoshop and make yourself look beautiful and lose weight and everything. And then when you when you meet somebody in person, you go, wow, you don't look anything like your <laughs> your profile picture. You know, the, I think they call that cat, catfishing on a dating site. Um, yes. <laughs> but people talk in these sort of you know, 30 second little blips with tech, uh, excuse me, with text messages. And it's not the same thing. It really is. Yeah, it's, it's a very kind of cold, unsatisfying communication with somebody. At least I think it well, is. I agree with you. And you know, the thing is, is, is so much gets lost in a text. You know, you can't read someone's body language. No, you can't read someone's facial expressions. And the thing about the Internet is, you know, you see out here on these social media sites, people are a lot more willing to say mean things when they can hide behind their front door. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. so there's no consequence except for what you might get in replies. And I always use that asset test of if I'm going to post something online, would I be willing to say it to that person actually when I'm standing across from them? And that's how I have governed my interactions online, at least you know, over these last few years. But you, you go out there and you read some of the things that people say. And it's kind of shocking that people can be really pr pretty mean. Oh, cruel. Um, at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's a very great attitude that you've got. You know, would I be willing to say that to someone's face. I think that's right. a good test that everybody should do. Yeah. You know, you know, when I was working in the you know, when I was working in the IT industry, I supported uh, contracts with the federal government and they would always say to us, don't ever put anything down in writing that you don't want to see on the front page of The Washington Post. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's so about right. <laughs> 
Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I think yeah. if you if you work in an environment like that, you tend to to have that mindset um, embedded in your thinking as you move along. Uh, now, I'm not saying I haven't slipped up every now and then and said something that I wasn't sorry for. Um, I think we've all done that. Uh, but, you know, if you can correct that moving forward and not do it again, then you're in pretty good shape, right? Absolutely. Well, it's also this kind of conflicted, I don't know, conflicted observations, for lack of a better term, where on the one hand, you see the Internet world and people just saying the most awful things to each other or about other people. And then you go to the supermarket and it's far more subdued. So you're like, well, which world am I living in? Am I living in that <laughs> one or am I living in this one? Uh, and I think people have gone nuts. Yeah. Yeah, and then they sometimes people just lash out and, you know, just take a gun and start shooting people. Oh, because they, I think there's a lot of conflict going on between the virtual world and the real world. And I think in some cases, we're kind of seeing that conflict kind of come together. Um, you know, in some cases, depending on what the situation is, um, you see people kind of taking out some of their angst on other people, even when they are with them, right? Yeah. You know, in situations like that. Right. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things that I talk about um, in Live Your Humanity is I, I have I have a supermarket test. You know, if you're if you're really wanting to connect with somebody, why not make the effort to have a conversation with the person that's you know ringing up your groceries for you? And that's a really great way to get out there and kind of you know test your your connection muscles is what I I like to call them. You know, if you can have a meaningful conversation with somebody who's actually doing something for you and treating them like a human being, because, you know, there is a human being there that's helping you. And if you can have a meaningful connection and a conversation with somebody, you're well on your way to working through that in the rest of your life as well in other situations that you face. Right. Um, and I say that, Douglas, because, you know, I, I did work for Safeway for quite a while, you know, when I was in college and I did you know, stocking shelves to working in the produce section to ringing up groceries. And there were times where customers would come through and you were just completely invisible to them. They didn't want to have anything to do with you. You know, they were just there to do what they needed to do and to get out. And I think that if we take that time to take a step back and really take a look at one another, which is actually a tagline that I use um, you know, for, for my website, then we can connect with one another in a more meaningful way. Okay, so this book has nothing to do really with uh, your career in finance. I mean, it's not a financial guide necessarily. No. Okay, so Live Your Humanity is the title. It, it sounds more like an epiphany type book, like you had this epiphany after your car accident and took a step back and said, you know what, we need to I need to look at life completely differently or something like that. Is that about right? Yeah, I, I think that's, you, you've nailed it. Okay. Um, I think that I, I took a look at myself, but I also was taking a look and being very observant of what was going on around me and noticing how people were or were not interacting with one another. And sometimes that also took the form of social media. And when I wrote the book, I was, it's almost like I was looking back in time a little bit and looking at occasions in my life where I could have chosen to do something a little differently and occasions where I chose the, the correct path. And so I wrote about that, talking about here's what happened with me and here's what can happen with you as well. We've got just about a minute and a half left. Uh, so what is the takeaway? If I pick up the book and I read the book, what do you hope I will get out of it? What I hope you get out of it is that we can step out of, you know, behind the veil, as you and I talked earlier, you know, of our, of our electronic devices and get out there and maybe cure some of this loneliness that we're seeing in the world today by actually spending time and understanding with and understanding one another. And I think that if we do that, we have a lot more room for added meaning and connection in our lives that will prove to be pretty valuable to all of us. You know, 
no one gets along in this world by themselves. We all need each other. And I really think that at the end of the day, if we can just learn how to connect with one another in a meaningful way, we'll see a lot of the social problems that we're seeing today and some of the negative interactions that we're having with one another today disappear. I think you should send your book to Putin. I think he, <laughs> he needs it very desperately at this point. If I thought that he would read it, I actually would, <laughs> uh, would put the bill to uh, send it over there to him. Translate it into <laughs> Russian. Uh, Ron, thanks so much for coming on. We do have to wind this down. Do you have a website you want to give out? Uh, sure. My website is uh, www.ronhammond.com. Okay, great. And the book is available through your website as well as Amazon, I assume. And Yes, it's know. on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes & Noble. Um, it's, it's out there and available right now. Okay, great. Well, thanks again for coming on. It was nice talking to you and uh, best of luck with the book.